My name is Jane Turner from writewithjane.com. I help authors to write, publish and promote their books. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session of Authors in Conversation. Today we'll be hearing from Susanna Hammond about her wonderful book, The Body Connection, an analog reboot to digital times. Now to introduce Susanna, I'm going to read the first paragraph of chapter one because it pretty much sums up where she's coming from and the difference that she wants to make. You've got to hand it to the trend forecasters. The built-in obsolescence of mortality may have claimed individuals, but just like the tsunami of wall-to-wall -wall plastics they predicted in the 1960s, their mad-capped hypothetical gig has proved scarily durable. With a business model characterised by wishful thinking, flashy guesswork and zero responsibility, these opportunistic corporate soothsayers still manage to straddle big business and social engineering with their peculiar and shameless oeuvre of marketing cunningly disguised as trend clairvoyance. In short, trend forecasters neither create nor produce, but they get paid squillions of bucks for telling us what we need before we know we need it. Nice work if you can get it. So Susie, tell us, what is it that bugged you enough to write this wonderful book? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> One of the sayings that I've got on my website, I've got it on my cards, it's I love it to death, I've used it for 35 years, is there is more to life than simply increasing its speed. It's a Mahatma Gandhi quote. And, um, you know, I mean, even he thought things were going a bit fast at one point, right? So essentially we've gone from, uh, just as an overview, we've gone from three cuts a minute in our TV programs to something like 120 cuts a minute. A lot of people don't even understand time lapses anymore or never did really. They don't understand where you move from one time frame to another in a, um, a clip, for instance, or a movie. And I just noticed that everything was going faster and faster. And there's a lot of research out there that says the kids are taking in this speed. But actually, we don't take in things like that. We take in TV and screens and all of that um, in that way. But we don't take in real life like that so we're not uh, we're not used to being totally bombarded with this very fast information that most of us can't even consciously remember so that certainly bugged me and then the next thing was people were coming to me and quoting these um sort of fad people of facebook and um uh, all, all kinds of other media, YouTube in particular, you know, who are promising the world and um, really uh, making a lot of money out of, out of uh, doing it. You know, the three things you need to know about this, that and the other, you know, and, and they, um, they were signing people up at a rate of knots because people have always wanted this magic silver bullet and they were getting bombarded with this. And I was seeing people who um, were proud of the fact they didn't know how to cook and they ordered their food from corporate entities and they did all of this. And I suddenly thought, it's time. And when, when people started coming to me and saying, but I read, I read on Facebook that uh, you should eat this or you should drink celery juice or you should do, you, you, you know, and they had some serious conditions. And I was thinking, wow, this is time, it's time I started putting uh, the basic analog um, message down because we are analog, we are not digital beings, you know. Uh, God help us if we're digital beings, I think Mark Zuckerberg would prefer it yes. uh, with his new meta universe, but, but really we are analog beings, so we are variable, we are not fixed. Um, notions in any at any space or time hmm. so um you know that broadly is the answer to your question 
Yes, and just um, something's going on in the background. Oh, it's birds. Oh, but what? What those cheeky buggers? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm thinking of it. No. I've got a garden full of trees. I'm the only person oh. in the street that didn't raise everything to the ground and put them around, oh. around a lawn. Well so done. I've got a garden full of trees. So if I've got, you know, birds or frogs or something, um, please, if you can't hear me for the birds, let me know. Oh, no, well, that won't be the problem now. I feel quite comfortable that that was what was happening. I've got a little forest here, so, yes. you know. Yes. Yeah. And what caught me when you were talking about, you know, people will say, oh, yes, well, the kids are learning at such and such a rate. What people don't recognise is that human beings, we evolve over time, but we yeah. don't evolve that and quickly. The amount of change that has happened to the way that information is disseminated, yeah. not to mention the way that food is processed. Yeah. The body is in you know, we're, we're, we're in a foreign country, in a sense, our poor bodies. They don't know what the heck's going on. Well, really, you know, we have the same livers and digestive systems that we had 5, 10, 20, 30,000 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is that they're not expected, well, in those days, they weren't expected to last as long. I mean, if you survived childhood, you were mostly a toothless old crone by the time you were 30, if you lived that long. Mm. Um, you know, the, uh, and the only processing we had, you know, was sort of taking a stone and beating some seeds with it, you know, or, or, or cooking it later, mm. right? But we have digestive systems that evolved before we even cooked mm. uh, food. And I think the, the, the really shocking thing for me was discovering um, how averse people are to knowing how, how their bodies work, you know, how what, that we have 12 operating systems in our bodies, so essentially, and, the, and how they work and, uh, and what we need to do to keep them healthy. Um, we, there, there are so many things that we need to know about our bodies and mainly people just listen to the little soundbite that says, whatever you've got, I've got the cure for it, you know? Mm. It's, a, it's a bit more than that. And the way you put that as well, that people don't like to know or don't want to know or resistant actually was your word. It's you scary. Know? Well, I was just going to say that because once you know it, uh, not only is it scary, but you, you then on some level at least have a responsibility Yes, but trying to do something about it. So that's um, it's a, it's a bit of a bind in a way. So people are la 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 la, you know, watching telly and yes. getting this, as you say, the sound bites. It's, and then uh, somebody comes along and offers them the magic silver bullet. In chapter two, you know, I've got this whole chapter on the origin of the magic silver bullet. You know, and right back to Gilgamesh's uh, time. You know where. Um, silver was considered to be a protectorant. You know, you put, people put it on their spear tips to protect them against this and that. And how it became a mythological um, or a mythical uh, uh, protectorant, and uh, and how we ended up with it just as a form of everyday speech. Now, as we're looking for the magic silver bullet, we don't want to know about the problem. We want somebody to tell us how to fix it so that we can move on. And I think that has never been more apparent than the last two years. <laughs> oh, isn't that true? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And what do you see happening? Are you feeling any shift in a positive direction or what's your sense? In, in what sense? Oh, just in terms of people's awareness. About themselves? Yes, and generally about that, you know, there isn't someone out there who's going to fix it for you. Um, gosh, that's that's a real yes and no kind of answer. I mean, some people have anyway. suddenly, mm. some people have suddenly really got it. Um, mm. and, uh, and other people are still hoping that either somebody's going to save them or some philosophy is going to save them you know I'm, I'm you know i'm all for holism i'm all for you know the true holistic way of looking at the body which is to use use everything that's useful to you you know there's there's so many 
um, things out there to do with uh, diet and movement and um, uh, eating and this, this and that. Use what is, is going to improve your health and you can use it whether you're very ill or slightly ill or not ill at all, you know, to maintain yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my feeling about it. I think people have still to grasp the the meaning of um, holistic practice, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that the pandemic has, in many ways, uh, made people even more inclined to get their answers off Facebook. Mm. Interesting, that isn't it? Yeah. And in terms of the holistic, I, I just want to read out your uh, all of the modalities that you work within because this is this really does speak to what you're talking about. Yeah. There's uh, aromatherapy, yeah. remedial massage, somatic body work, bioenergetics, field and Christ technique, and natural skin care. So there's a lot in there that um, you know you've. And Tai Chi falls prevention and a lot of yoga and well there's there's, oh, cool. there's a whole bunch of somatic dip disciplines that mm -hmm. that uh, pe people are definitely embracing things like Tai Chi and uh, and yoga. Mm -hmm. um, I must say here that Tai Chi is not just for the elderly. It's uh, you know if the Shaolin monks use it uh, to warm up for their battle practice, I think we can all use it. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. uh, but my background really started at five in, in rescuing little hedgehogs and uh, birds and squirrels and ducks and things out of the British snow in Norfolk, you know, and, and hiding them in my bedroom in shoeboxes and trying to nurse them back to health and trying to work out what made things live and what caused them to die, you know, from whatever injuries they had. And um, uh, so that's my basic interest and also being an advocate for people. So, you know, far and away from just doing a bit of aromatherapy or remedial massage on them, what I, you find out an awful lot about people when they're lying on a, a bench in front of you mm -hmm. um, and they don't, you know, there's things that they can't see that they don't know about and also people tell you stuff, you know. So I work with in palliative care. I work with uh, people with cancer and recovering from that. I've worked with Parkinson's, with uh, rehabbing people, keeping them moving with Parkinson's. I've worked with people with dementia, um, you know, all, all, all kinds of different uh, scenes, if you like. And I've been very privileged to have people trust me to, to do that. And for me to work in with their medical people. Mm, that's a perfect I, blend, isn't it, really? Where yeah, so a, a psychiatrist, for instance, sent me very many uh, of her patients just to learn self-care, you know. Mm. So I was dealing quite a lot with uh, bipolar disorder and various other disorders, right? But, um, yeah, you know, just to... Uh, it's 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 wonderful when the medical profession steps outside of their model mm. and mm. brings in somebody like me. Yes, that's obviously a deeply caring psychiatrist with an open mind who's referring people to you, not not just writing on the prescription pad and uh, yeah. you know, and somebody who's interested in healing, that's not as 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 I am. It's, it's like let's see how 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 good a result we can get from yeah. adding a few things in that you wouldn't have thought, you know, mm, mm. right? So like with bipolar disorder, most, of, most people who have it have shocking diets. Mm. And so when you actually get a food diary down and you, you have a look at what they're eating and you change that, I've got a 21 foods a day um, diet that... Uh, there's a free, there will be a free link to that. Um, but when they start eating 21 foods a day instead of three, um, yes. Yes. it doesn't it doesn't cure the bipolar necessarily, but it certainly improves their mood and their daily uh, sense of well-being. Mm. And it certainly levels them out in many, many uh, 
over many different areas, really. Yes, fantastic. Yeah? Look, that's a good time to point out to everybody that in the chat box, you'll see a very long, um, what do you call those URLs or something? If you were to take a copy of that, definitely take a, a copy of that, I will say, so that yeah. then you can hop on to Susie's website. You can be buying the book if you want to. You can be downloading the freebies that she has and just generally looking at the resources that are there for you just to, you know, if come on, you've come on this call for a reason and um, connection with Susie, I think, will help you to be getting to wherever you want to go in one way or other. And I'm um, in Sydney, but I can do Zoom yeah. consults. Uh, and, and I have been doing Zoom consults for obvious reasons. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And there's this question of connection that is a, it's a big one for me. So, you know, you've deliberately used these words, the body connection. Yeah. And, you know, the other the other piece that I could have read out, but I didn't was a, very much about that. In the world of connectivity, we have never been less connected uh, yeah. to others and potentially to ourselves. So yeah. would you talk just a little bit about that, Susie. How, and how does that manifest? I guess the interesting thing, too, is how does that manifest in physical ailment? Gosh, it's, um, I think everybody now is talking about um, mental health uh, during lockdown for a lot of people, you know, and the rise in domestic violence and all other kinds of violence. You know, I mm. personally find people are a bit edgy, you know, um, and uh, I think, I think we've got all this information and, uh, do you, you, you know, you see people, <laughs> you see people sitting, if it, well, I, I remember seeing people sitting in a restaurant. I haven't seen people for a while, but I remember that seeing people sitting in a restaurant and you've got mum and dad and the two kids and the kids are on tablets and the mum and dad are scrolling through their mobiles. You know, or the, or the mum and dad are trying to talk and the kids are watching a movie. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I find it, um, I find that really, uh, really, really difficult that, that we're pacifying uh, children in that way. You know, I've, I've got a part in the book that says the children these days are so, are so busy doing this and that, that they and so engaged with their screens in their downtime that they're actually spending in some countries less time outside than the average prisoner you know, in a jail right well, right it's 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 quite different from when you know you went out in the morning and came back when dinner was ready you know that's it's very it's it's very different but the the connectivity i think that um that i really think we've lost um other than the connectivity with us ourselves because we're we're focused outwards on this thing's going faster and we've got to go faster and we've got to achieve this and that and all the rest of it, is the connection between what we now consider as normal uh, in terms of what we are able to afford for our bodies, right, like our food and um, our clothing and, and the enormous amount of waste and our self-help devices, even, you know, washing machines and fridges and all of this stuff, that we now fail to see what the connection with us and the landfill is, <laughs> right? And we, 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 we can afford this stuff. We can afford to eat meat now. And so uh, we do, but we don't really care about where it comes from uh, or the suffering or the denuding of the country that goes with it. Um, we don't really care about that. We don't really care that whereas once our refrigerators lasted for 30 years, I actually had one that lasted for 30 years. I had a washing machine that did. Now, now they could put in, um, I don't know, five years and that is considered normal. Normal. And where, where does all this stuff go? Our phones that we change every year, it's, 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 we're completely blank to it. So yeah. we've lost, we've actually lost in, in, in terms of we're, we're making our lives more convenient 
And so when we make them more convenient, everything goes faster and then we've got to make them more convenient again. <laughs> and on and on it goes, you know, and so we forget. No wonder people want a quick fix because they haven't got time to have a slow one. <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> Very true. Very true. And, yeah. um, and where do you see the book going and taking you? Is, is the book potentially a bridge between you and people just desperately needing help who aren't yet ready to reach out to someone for help? Oh, that, that too. Um, I know that a lot of people have bought the book um, because they've, they've, they've bought a copy for themselves and I bought a copy for some friends of theirs that they think needs to re need to read it right mm -hmm. um right. and 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 it's a first step for a lot of them mm -hmm. uh, some of them will get halfway through it and go oh this is too hard facebook must have something shorter that i can <laughs> look at you know there must be appeal. Uh, huh? there must be appeal it must there must be a pill for that. Mm. There mm. must be a pill, um, and uh, and basically uh, there are plenty of pills, but they're not uh, going to help you when when you're doing the basic care. And as for look, I, I lost all my speaking gigs during um, uh, COVID, uh, and this this is me doing one. So that's <laughs> that's. Uh, a, a, a marvelous thing. I would certainly like to be getting out there and um, uh, and talking more to people about, mm. you know. So there's a uh, there's a oh, is there a question? I'm too oh, yes. There's a question from Tamana. Uh, it's 21 foods a day, and um, so Tamana, that that question really. Uh, when, when one of the things I do um, is um, holistic skincare, another one is pain relief um, and uh, gut problems and all of that kind of thing. So the first thing I do and mood. So the first thing I do is get people to keep a, a two week food diary. And I can tell a lot by that. And I have had people literally who have something made with white flour uh, with fat in it and caffeine. Something That's like 95% of Australians don't eat five vegetables or fruits a day, for instance. I mean, it's horrendous. We live in this country where um, we, we have vegetables all, all year round and fruits all year round and people don't eat them. And, and what I've discovered is there is an enormous fear of chopping. Chopping? Shopping, yes, people can't be bothered, so um, they don't chop. Um, so when I start to say to people, you've only got three foods here or five, you know, sometimes they have jam in the list and, <laughs> you know, or a bit of Vegemite or there's some broccoli in the other room, you know, and um, uh, or they're suffering from a bad experience with a vegetable when they were eight or six or four or something and they've never quite gotten over it. That's, you know, it's, you know, when I'm talking to those people, they're going, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't know what to do. So I said, well, you know, in Japan, they eat 30 different types of food a day and the people in front of me usually go white and say, well, I can't possibly do that. And I said, well, if the Jap Japanese can do it, I'm sure you can. But how about how about we we settle on 21 foods a day? How would that suit you? And they go white again, right? And so then I spend the next six weeks building them up and showing them how easy it is to get 21 different types of food in, into themselves each day. And that's what that is about and that's what the uh, download the pdf download with recipes uh, in it um, on my website is about yes and it's, and it's free I'm, I'm i'm giving it away <laughs> so tamana it's not so much about that there's the 21 best foods you should eat it's that you need that variety of good food, you know, that, yes, that you, need, you need a variety of food because mm -hmm. each of them does something different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you need to get the breadth of, 
uh, minerals and, and, and vitamins across a wi the widest variety that you can afford. You don't have to be, it doesn't actually cost that much when you plan it out. You know, it's, it's not a big, it's really not a big leap. What, what is the big leap is the chopping. <laughs> that darn chopping, you know. <laughs> That's really, you know, I wouldn't have picked that, but you've experienced chopping more than once. Chopping, and oh. and you know who are the best at it is is the Mediterranean people. You know the the um, the, the the Asians are, are great at it. They're they're all choppers. You know the the Vietnamese food, Chinese food, uh, Thai food. Um, you know. M Moroccan food, uh, Lebanese food, Italian food, Greek food, they're all mad choppers. And they all, they all have, you know, terrific diets. I mean, the Mediterranean and Asian diets are recommended, um, I think, all over the world by nutritionists because of the way vegetables and combinations are used and how there's, there's actually not so much meat in those diets. You know, there's a whole lot of other things like, God forbid, vegetables. Yep, and uh, and spices and things to flavor it up, not the artificial exactly. flavorings and such. Yeah, and fast cooking. Mm. Fast cooking. You know, um, not everything burnt to death um, on a on a barbecue. You know, um, and and you know, socially, one one of the things Australians didn't used to eat that much meat either. Um, but the the more affluent we've become, the more meat and animal products we eat. Now, that's not to say that I would say go vegetarian or vegan tomorrow, but what I'm saying to you is give it some thought is that for a lot of people in this country, eating meat is a sign of affluence. Mm. And, right, so especially I was talking to... Uh, a, 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 a Maltese woman the other day and she's married to a Greek and uh, uh, she was talking to me about her husband's gut problems and I said do you think um, the 21 foods today might be inspirational to him and she said oh, he won't eat vegetables he's, he's, he's Greek and I said well what, is, what does that mean exactly well he's old style Greek he's come here they've made a lot of money and now he doesn't have to he can eat meat now he doesn't have to eat vegetables Wow. Um, yeah. my, uh, my Irish brother-in-law is the same, right? He, he, he hates vegetables with a passion, but he will eat a potato. A white vegetable, <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> oh yeah, greens, greens are like anathema to him. Yes. You know? Oh, my God. <laughs> People, we're strange. Now, what's the next book going to be about, Susie? Oh, gosh. Um, it's... Uh, it's a piece of fiction. I'm writing a piece of, um, what would you say, uh, ecologically subversive uh, fantasy for eight to 12 year olds. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so that's, that's all I can tell you. I hope it's, I hope it's as funny as, as, as the body connection. Yes. I do. Look, actually, that's another thing to mention to everybody. This is an incredibly serious topic that Susie has made a joy to read about because of it, just a natural quirkiness. There's a definite lightness to this material and um, some fabulous uh, sketches, I suppose you would call them, wouldn't you? And yeah. funny sketches at the beginning. Of the I think I can hold them. I can hold them up. You could, you could hold but, it. But this, so. this, I'd, uh, oh, let me see. I don't, uh, oh, it's tricky with the um, backgrounds. Yeah, there, you there, see there. that? Yeah. And yep. it's, it's the beginning chapter, which is life on the cutting edge. And you've got all these people standing in front of their boss with band-aids all over their faces saying, frankly, sir, we're sick of being on the cutting edge. Yes. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, yes. Uh, this, this book covers everything from diet and movement and food to sleep to teeth, uh, to what goes on in your digestive system, to what happens when the food leaves the fork, basically, right? And uh, and the tooth one is hilarious. There's a, there's a cartoon there with a woman lying back in the chair with um, all this food 
in in her mouth, sort of fruits and vegetables and chicken legs. Yeah, Di's got it there. It's called bite up. Hold it up a bit, Di. And she, oh, yeah. she's got a he's, he's got a face full of food, and the dentist is going. You really need to floss more. And and it's <laughs> it's a very funny piece on on uh, on how people lie to their dentists because they don't want to have the lecture, you know. <laughs> good. Oh, so now listen, Annette's asked a good question here. What's that? Um, she's saying if we change our diet in the way that you're recommending, what changes would we expect to see in our body? Well, um, first of all, I think your bowels would work better, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's, there's, there's a rule of thumb. If you're belching, it's an upper digestive system problem, Yeah. If you are um, uh, farting, can I say that on, on this, uh, then uh, it's a lower digestive system problem, okay? So when you change your diet, you will notice your poo changes. You know, nobody really wants to talk about uh, poo. Everybody does it and nobody's really talking about it too much it's a bit all a bit distasteful so you would expect that you would expect that you would probably um you may initially burp and fart more as your body gets used to more fiber uh, you might uh consider that um if your diet has been for a very long time just the three foods a day that i was talking about like i had a client who had McDonald's three times a day at one point, you know, washed down with a few Coca-Colas. And, um, and so I can't imagine that the little cilia all throughout her uh, digestive system, which are those little fingery kind of things which, which absorb the food on the inside of you, I can't imagine that they were terribly healthy. And in fact, a lot of them would have been flattened out entirely and absorbing nothing. Um, so you could, you could expect to see maybe that improve. You might be able to see things like diverticulitis improve. Uh, you may notice that your migraines are suddenly gone. You may notice that you wake up with more energy in your whole self every morning. You may also notice that you sleep better because you've got some magnesium and uh, various other nutrients in your system. I mean, the changing... Changing your your diet is a um, as, is is a huge thing to do. I know, but if you start it gradually, if you're eating three foods a day and you move to say five or seven, and then you have a shot at ten the next week, and if you break that up over three meals and a couple of snacks a day, it's not that hard to do it. You know, I'm a big fan of throwing everything in a bowl frankly, putting a dressing on it and doing it that way. So I hope that answers your question, Annette. Mm. And I reckon mood change as well. Oh, mood, mood changes are huge when, when, when you change your, your diet. It's, it's just, um, it just goes, goes without saying. I mean, I think a lot of us are sort of semi-starving to death. You know, we live in this very affluent country and there's a lot of malnutrition. You know, and and this lack of nutrition is to do with, you know, it comes back to that meat thing. We're now affluent, so we're too posh to cook. You know, we don't need to cook. And also it's convenient and why should I and stuff like that, you know. So, um, you know, I think Michael Mosley, I think, but didn't he put his son on a, a, a junk food diet? And within six weeks, the poor kid who was an athlete, you know, went from being an athlete to being a total couch potato with high blood pressure and pre-diabetes and all kinds of things. And his, his bowel was a mess and, and, and he, his, you know, his teeth were and gums were suffering, all, all of this sort of stuff, right? it's um that happened in six weeks so you imagine if you have a lifetime of it mm. Mm. diane's saying that her son has autism and yeah. when his diet goes off the rails it affects his mood for sure yeah, yeah. and when he gets back on track 
uh, it doesn't take long for the mood to to pick up. Yeah, these that seems it's to- this is terribly important, you know, for whether whether you have a condition like autism or whether you mm-hmm. have bipolar disorder or whether you're just plain depressed. You know, it 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 doesn't. It's right across the spectrum. Even if you're perfectly well, if you start eating rubbish, your mood will be rubbish as well. Mm. You know? Yes, yes. Well, look, we've been getting lots of great questions here, but does anyone want to unmute and, and ask more questions or share anything? Um, what do you think the effect of sugar has? Because there's much more sugar in our diet now, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Unconscious and conscious sugar. I mean, does that contribute to mood? as well yeah it contributes to everything we don't need that much sugar they look you have to you have to understand that i I guess that you know there was a time when we didn't eat any uh additional sugars aside from uh say honey or you know various um but plant sugars right and then the entire slave worldwide slave trade was built on sugar right there was i don't know if anybody's aware of it but there were a bunch of victorian women who boycotted putting little lumps of sugar in their tea because they were fighting against the slave trade right we've had blackbirding here in australia we've got um, we've got the, the, the runoff from all the sugarcane farms, right? We have into, into, into the Great Barrier Reef and everywhere else. We've got um, uh, also people in big food companies, in, but we know what's known as big food. We've got uh, scientists, so pe- people with actual university degrees trying to work out how to make their food more addictive for the likes of you and I. And sugar and salt and the mouthfeel of fat, right, trans fats in particular, right, good old palm oil, so let's kill a few more orangutans for this. These university-educated boffins have are, are trying to addict us to this food, which they then advertise as being delicious. Well, of course it's delicious if you eat that kind of food you know but the more the more delicious they make it the more sugar is in it the more you know so they take out the salt and put the sugar in they take out the fat and put more sugar in they you know and and our bodies are not made to take in this amount of sugar so what happens to us is, is that not only is the, the, the obesity rate, especially in America where they eat a lot of this stuff, right? Uh, but Australia, I think, is second to America in the world for obesity, right? And, and this whole dietary thing where, where this is now normal food. 30 years ago, McDonald's wasn't a normal food, you know? And neither was Kentucky Fried and all, all of this stuff. But but so we've got high rates of obesity, high rates of pre pre diabetes, high rates of diabetes too, right? High rates of um, uh, clogged arteries, uh, cholesterol, all 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 of this stuff, you know, um, which which you can sheet home to the change in our diet in the last thirty or 40 years. It's happened very, very gradually. And as we become more and more busy and more and more lazy in our cooking, goes back to the chopping, right? Um, we eat more and more of the stuff. And, and these people are very good at hiding the sugar in things. So, you know, I mean, if you look, mayonnaise, as far as I know, shouldn't have sugar in it, for instance, you know. I mean, who puts sugar in mayonnaise? But if you actually have a look at, my, at all the jars that you're buying, and if you see sugar within the first four, you know that there's a heap of sugar in it, you know, because it's, it's supposed to be in order of appearance in, in, or amount in, in the product. Our bodies can't tolerate this. So we've got fatty livers, we've got pancreases that are exploding with, you know, um, I hope that answers your question, Annette. 
Oh, yeah, well, I was interested because I remember reading somewhere that the reason they put a pickle in a, in a, a McDonald's burger is mm. because it means that it's um, rated by the American Food Organization as not being a confection. The pickle's uh, just enough to put it over the edge. Yeah, well, it's a dill pickle. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. you know, so, so if you see, you know, the good old Polish um, uh, dill, dill pickle, if you see sugar in that, you know, I think Coles puts one out, they've got sugar in it. That's not a dill pickle. The dill pickles are salty pickles, you know. Um, it's, but we, 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 just, we just don't need it. And none of it, you know, it's food you don't have to chew. I mean, not only do you not have to chop it, but you don't have to chew it. <laughs> No. And chewing is important, isn't it? It is. Your digestive system starts behind your teeth, you know. In fact, it probably starts in your uh, limbic system when you smell the food in front of you, you know, so you start salivating. And then if you don't chew it um, and you don't get the saliva in it because that's got the enzymes which help break it down so that your stomach can handle it. If you do what, um, what a lot of people do, they take a gigantic mouthful, they're filling up the fork with the next mouthful before they've even chewed that, and they don't chew it, and it goes down in great unprocessed lumps into their guts, and they wonder why they've got a pain. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> they wonder why they've got reflux. Mm -hmm. they were you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely vital to chew stuff. So we don't chew and we don't chop. Mm. There's probably another CH in there. There must be another one. <laughs> Interesting. Any more questions? The other CH is choose. <laughs> ah, choose, yes. Good point. Good. Chew, chop and choose. Good. What about chunder? No. <laughs> well... <laughs> And that, and that too, that, <laughs> I don't, you know, I mean, really, if you see what a lot of people are eating day to day, it's a wonder more people aren't chundering really, but I think, uh, I think there's a bit of that around. It says a lot about the body acclimatising though, to, to what you're eating, doesn't it? We, we don't all have upset stomachs necessarily. And then once we get hooked on the sugar, it takes more and more and more to get the fix too. So it's a, it's a truly evil matter, the way the food industry works. Oh, it is. I, th I think it is because they are about um, enticing us to eat more, that when people say you really don't want to be eating that, they're going, oh, but I like it. Mm. And it's been around for ages and it's normal and I can afford that and all the rest. And then because they are used to the taste and the mouth feel they can't move away to anything anything that doesn't have that mm. uh, is something that they don't feel is food you know um, I, I, I mean we've become very strange in terms of, of food this is and if, if Mark Zuckerberg has his way you know we're, we will all be living in this meta universe where we won't talk to each other and we'll probably I don't know, have our food beamed in and sprays or something, you know. It, it's, I, I don't know if there's anybody here um, who remembers a time in the 70s when they were talking about futuristic food coming in tubes and uh, tablets and pills like um, that they were giving the space uh, explorers, you know, that they're saying, yes, we're headed in that direction. And I'm thinking, oh, my don't think so. I don't but think it also could be right. Also, <laughs> saying it in a way as if it was a good thing. <laughs> you know. Yes. Well, it's convenience. It's like it's like having driven us all to total despair by making us endlessly busy and and you know endlessly um, trying to um, you know achieve glory in some way or another. And making everything so expensive that you don't actually have anybody at home cooking anymore because both parents have got to be working and paying for the kids in daycare just to have a house, just to have a roof over your head. Never, you know, it may not be a house. Um, it's it's like everybody's run off their feet uh, trying to stay on this mouse wheel, and and then they come up they come up with this answer 
whereas we have something that's convenient for you, right? It'll just, you know, when your goal at the end of the day is to take your shoes off and lie down, but not until you've fed the kids or the husband or yourself or whatever, and you've got something that you can have in 10 minutes via Uber Eats or something like that, um, that's that's the promise. That's why we have Uber Eats. Mm. You know, U Uber Eats is the delivery, so all those delivery services are a phenomenon of the last three or four years, you know, before that. Um, you know, we, we didn't have those big uh, corporations, you know, which are paying absolute peanuts to the poor kids who risk their lives on the road to deliver a hamburger to us because we don't want to chop and we don't want to chew. <laughs> now, what's your best case study? The best one? Oh, gosh. Oh, look, I've been. You've got I've a been, lot. I'm sure you've got a bunch of them. I know. There's a bunch of them in the book. I've been so privileged to, um, to work with people. I mean, one that I'm really, really proud of was um, uh, that I actually treated uh, pro bono, you know, Years ago, was a young man who had fallen off um, uh, a cliff uh, in West Australia and been, had his leg crushed to powder pretty much by a boulder when he hit the ground. And he nearly bled out before they could get him to Perth. And, um, and by the time he got to me, he'd had all kinds of reconstruction, all kinds of... Um, skin grafts, he'd had uh, bone grafts, he'd had bits cut out of his hip and m made into uh, a new tibia and, and, and fibula. So he, he really, um, his, they, they had managed to put his foot kind of on sideways as well, you know, but look, he was so lucky to be alive. He was plagued by um, staph infection where on all these operation sites. He looked like he'd been attacked by a white pointer when I got him on the table. And one of my other clients who I'd rehabbed through a broken ankle sent him to me to see if there was anything I could do to help him. Um, he was very, very depressed. He said to me, one of the first things he said to me was, no, nobody's ever going to want me now. No, no girl is ever going to go out with me. I will never work again, and that's it. And he was about 27 or something. And so I decided, because he had no money, I decided once a year I'd take on a pro bono case and at least. And I said to him, all right, you, um, I don't know, rehab my bike and I'll treat you. And that's what I did. And we did, we did everything. And... Um, you know, from remedial massage to pain relief to dietary changes to all of the stuff I've been talking about, uh, to energy healing, to Tai Chi, uh, balance work, to, um, in fact, I trained him to put weight on this busted leg, but, but using uh, Tai Chi uh, force prevention techniques and, and Qigong. And within say three months he came and he arrived on a bicycle. Wow. How That's one thing, right? He still couldn't drive, but he arrived on a bicycle. Then he got a job that he could go to on his bicycle. Yeah. And then um, about, about a year later, he, he came back for a, a treatment and his infections had, were quite a lot uh, reduced i mean i'm sure you know those infection rates are huge with that amount of surgery but because he changed his diet and his attitude and we did visualization work to take his energy back into his leg and all of this anyway he came to me and he said i'd like to do the city to serve <laughs> so how is that for confidence though from somebody who was saying nobody's going to want me i know i won't be able to get a job it's all oh. over He'd look, and again, long story short, we did a lot of Tai Chi. We did, he had fitness, the aerobic fitness from his bike riding, but we had to plan the city to surf. He had to do it with a mate. He had to train really hard for it. I got, I, I, it was excruciating the training I put him through. He power walked it and he did it with a mate who was pushing a wheelchair. And I said, at any point you can bail out of this. So after that, I didn't see him, oh, gosh, maybe for five or six years. And then he, 
he rang me out of the blue and he said, uh, he said, I'm, I'm in Sydney um, and I'd like to come and, and see you. I've got something to show you. And so he did. And it turned out that he had got married to the love of his life and he brought his three-year-old daughter oh. with him. Oh, that's one. You know, you wouldn't know except for a, a slight limp, you know, and of course the injury is massive, so he's always going to have some kind of residual issue with that that he's going to have to manage, as people do when they've had that level of injury. But when he walked in with that little girl, you would never have known. And I'm so, I'm so proud to have been associated. Now, his story is in the book, and it's in the book in the How to Be Your Own Magic Silver Bullet chapter it's like everybody's looking for the magic silver bullet but what if the magic silver bullet is you yes and he was i mean he's the most shining example of magic silver bullet um i can i can think of really fantastic i'm glad i asked that question it really yeah. kind of shifts the purpose here is the average person who could be doing a lot to keep themselves well and healthy but doesn't have the knowledge and he's yeah. what he had a horrendous situation to to knock them out of their complacency I yeah. think, in the way now that reminds me there was one more thing I had to ask you about what was the medical rescue that gave you that oh. change in course it's what really bucketed me out of um advertising you know sitting around writing about fabric softness and cuddling things and doing all of that to um into into the healing business the man that i was destined to marry uh was misdiagnosed with a terminal inoperable brain tumor by a university college hospital neurosurgical department and so um you know knowing pretty much nothing about anatomy and physiology i got on a plane and went over there to either help him die or get him the heck out of there and um and the more I sat in on the meetings the more I realized that there was a very high degree of arrogance and there was uh uh from the chief uh uh neuro but but all of his staff and 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 I just didn't feel that they'd got the diagnosis right so I I um spent a lot of time in university college hospitals um, library which was deep down in the basement a lot of time talking to people in the uch bar who were training to be doctors to find out what kind of people they were and um and quite a lot of time after that uh busting the guy out of the hospital <laughs> Because he was going to die anyway, right? So what what could possibly go wrong? Um, and and getting him away from there so that I could seek some second opinions. So it took three months, and in the end, um, you you know, again, it's a much longer story. But in the end, um, there were some remarkable uh, coincidences. One was somebody turned up on a doorstep where I'd taken him in Kent with a copy of Sir Francis Chichester's um, uh, biography and how his wife busted him out of the hospital in London when he was misdiagnosed, right? And his wife kidnapped him out of the hospital and took him away. So that's one thing. And then all these people came to me. And one of the best things that came was a place called the London Imaging Centre, which had literally just opened in, I think it was Harley Street, and they had no one to play with um, and because they literally opened that week and I managed to get an appointment in there and they had the first what they call a digital angiogram um, where instead of putting it in through the carotid they could put it in through um, one of the veins in the arm and do an angiogram and marry it up to the CT scan. And at that time, CT scans were the be all end all of everything. And when they did that, they were able to see that in fact, he didn't have a terminal inoperable, fast growing midbrain tumor. 
what he had was an aneurysm and when he had an in, infarct which is the scar tissue which was left there was no tumor the thing these people these geniuses at uch including the head neuro um had misread their own ct scans right and and these people within like it took him 20 minutes to say there's no tumor here but he does have an infarct and so um anyway i ended up marrying him i have a 35 year old son with him we're now divorced unfortunately but uh he's very much alive um he's 74 he has to do certain things because around that site you um uh you have uh, a, a weakness if you like you develop a way of going around the nerve pathways in the in the brain around the scar tissue and uh it was i think in early 2020 that i helped him out of another jam where they were going to diagnose him at a sydney hospital with dementia and put him on a dementia drug when what he needed to do was um nerve pathway exercises to go around this because they uh, infarct was in the speech center right right so he called me in to do that as well he said i wonder if you could just look in on this so that's what i did so the the work as an advocate is very important to me i do quite a bit of that writing shotgun for people with doctors so that they can um you, you know because a lot of people are in shock mm -hmm. uh with their diagnosis and and they actually need somebody who can understand the medical jargon and take notes you know Mm, wow, important work that you do, Susie. Well, yeah, well, it's, it's quite exciting, really. It's absolutely. like detective work. I love it. Yes, yes. And this has just been a jam-packed session full of really wonderful material. And people, oh, you've got to get Susie's yeah. book. And just if it's easier than that long URL that we've got in the chat box there, it's islandsofbliss.com.au islandsofbliss.com.au and i'm on facebook as Susie hammond the body connection anybody needs to get in touch with me please feel free to message me on facebook i'm in sydney and islands of bliss again is is that little chunk of time that you take out to get off the mouse wheel and have your own little island of bliss that's why i call it that some people think that it's a, um, you know, a centre for something else that I've discovered. About two o'clock <laughs> in the morning, I get calls asking me if I'm still open. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, but no, that's, that's again, just empowering people to know that that place of bliss yeah. is only as far away as the yeah. time they give themselves to just disconnect from all the noise and just to be, just to be for a minute, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute feels too long. You know, it's funny, we're funny about these things. I've got two meditations on the website that are also free. I made them free during the pandemic. So if you need a little island of bliss meditation to put you to sleep or relax during the day, it's in there, so. Well, that sounds like a plan. Susie, thank you for all of this wonderful thank information. Thank you. For writing the fabulous book and for making yourself available so everybody you know that Susie's there if you need her and we will go off to our you know respective whatever we were doing before jobs possibly you know families maybe thinking about dinner um, or go off now really quite changed from hearing what you've said Susie thank you